Um, and this probably isn't what you've been waiting for all day. Um, <laughs> it's a, a long forgotten text by an artist who's dead from a social formation that's extinct. Um, but still I thought it would uh, do you good. Um, and I, I, I put the picture up, um, partly um, uh, the, the thing that uh, Tom mentioned last night when we were talking about the Jeff Wall text, he has this um, hyperbolic description of uh, painting, 19th century painting, the sort of caressing gestures of the brush and so on and so forth about art. Well, this is, um, of course, the opposite extreme of art altogether, isn't it? This is the uh, article that I'm talking about by Ian Byrne from the very beginning of our period today. The Art Market Affluence and Degradation came out in Art Forum in 1975. Um, and there is a reason that I've, I, I've, I've put it up there. I don't know whether you can see, but the, the, the picture on the left is a detail of the one on the right. And you see, it doesn't have any illustrations, so it's not very, it's not visual in the, in the sense that there might have been a reason for having it up there. But what it does have is these phrases which are distributed through the text in capital letters. Um, and they say, while we've been admiring our navels, we've been capitalized and marketed. But through realizing our socialization, might we be able to transform our reality? Now, um, when I mentioned this to um, Mel Ramsden, who was one of the artists who still works under the name of Art and Language, which is the um, formation that this text came out of. And uh, it's quite interesting that uh, Mel Ramsden couldn't really remember the text at all. But what he could remember was the, the way it was laid out with those um, um, words as, as images almost, words as slogans. And I think that um, gives a clue to something that's quite important because I'm not saying that uh, Ian Byrne's essay is itself a work of art, although the possibility of, of advancing an essay as a work of art had been canvassed in art and language several years earlier. But I think it's crucial to underline that it comes out of an art practice, that it, it, is, an art, it is an art practice itself rather than a, a critical practice, a, a critical piece of writing about an art practice. The, the Bourdieu text that uh, Kate has just um, introduced is, is a kind of a, a sort of revelation, if you like, that art isn't as pure as uh, its own ideology might have been be parodied in claiming it was. Whereas the Ian Byrne text is something different. It's written as a practicing artist, working within a community. And in fact, a, a sort of community within a community. He, he refers to it as people involved in the art and language community in New York in the early 70s. And I think it's written out of a kind of recognition, a sort of dawning uh, recognition and concern that the market was becoming a determining factor in the production of art itself, and increasingly so by that time. So this text then, which is quite short, was less the unmasking of an ideology than an explicit recognition of a state of affairs in which everybody was materially involved in the, the community that he was talking about, the sense that something had to be done about it in practice. Um, obviously, as artists, I guess also as the, the sense of a, a kind of practical criticism too. And, and part of the point of conceptual art had been to take over various aspects of intellectual production that had been hived off and, and filed as ancillary tasks, such as criticism and theory. So it was taking that over. And so I think that this text is interesting as an example of a kind of critical art practice in action, um, not just a commentary. And it, it's that that made me sort of plump for it in the end, rather than a, a couple of other things, because um, we were originally asked, I don't know whether this has come out during the day, to provide a, a sort of a couple of possible um, ideas for, for, for text to discuss. And both of the ones I was originally thinking of were, were a very different order of thing from this. One, one was David Harvey's um, Condition of Postmodernity, which was written, uh, I think, around about 1990. And the other was a more recent text by an uh, English um, critic and historian, a guy called Julian Stalibras, which is called Art Incorporated, that you may know. Um, and they both claim that um, 
art of the postmodernist period, this period that we are looking at, uh, 75 to 95, they both claim that it reflected the wider turn to a new stage of capitalism, which uh, succeeded the collapse of the post-war settlement during the 70s. So I ended up deciding not to use those, but to go back to this fairly primitive point, if you like, at the beginning of the period, which, where this text doesn't have the benefit of that kind of retrospective hindsight. But it does notice something at the moment that it's happening. And I think it's also quite interesting what it notices, because it seems at one level to be about modernism, which is something that we, we've sort of probably not talked a great deal about today in the focus on postmodernism. And that, that his phrase, admiring our navels, um, shows that he's talking about modernism. And he also sort of makes ironic um, negative comments about modernist technical problems to do with color and edge in uh, late abstract painting. But this is by 1975. This is written in 1975, and by then, modernism had already sort of been eclipsed. And I think it's quite interesting that, um, that, that Ian Byrne, who was an Australian artist active in New York uh, at that time, the, the, the framework that he was involved in, conceptual art or the new avant-garde, whatever label you want to use, before postmodernism was fully caught on, it had become dominant. And I think that he, the references he makes to process in here and ideas, he makes reference to them in the same sentence as color and edge. So I think it's an indication that from his point of view and from that of his art and language community, that those new practices were as atomized and as formalist and as client to the market as had been there on his predecessors. So he's interested in the idea of a community, as he calls it, doing something. And um, he also mentions other things sort of outside the immediate orbit of art practice itself. He talks about art education, museums, criticism as component parts of an overarching system. If I can just pop up another. There you see, these ideas were evident in, in, in these kinds of projects here, the, the anti-textbook, which was a few months earlier, and then the Fox, which came out just a few months later, and on it, in, in its inside cover has this phrase here about building a community. So it, it's not just one voice, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perspective which is sort of shared like a kind of um, practice. Um, and I think that one thing that sort of begins to sort of draw towards the end here. One thing that I think is interesting is that the Ian Byrne piece takes its cue from a registration in the very first couple of sentences of what he calls an impending economic crisis. And he goes on to discuss the possibility of what's going to happen, that art had become a kind of globalized system. He calls it international because globalization hadn't become a word any more than postmodernism at that point. And he ends by speculating on the collapse of American capitalism and the rise of a world economy no longer wholly determined by the West. So we've got something that looks a little bit more like that than anything that Ian Byrne could have, um, you know, sort of imagined, I suspect, at that time. Um, even though much has changed. I mean, there are many things that he talks about which are pretty well out of date. But, um, you know, there are other things which seem as though they've um, come true and uh, demand our attention. Um, I, I suspect that he would recognize quite a lot in the situation that we are in today, even as, uh, as there are things which are changed. And so we were, we were asked to reflect on the, this body of texts, uh, you know, to see um, what, what elements from the present uh, seem to be of less significance, what seems to still be relevant. And I think that um, Ian Byrne sort of turning the spotlight on the operation of the market and its uh, sort of structural determining effect upon the content of practice is not something that's uh, slipped from relevance. Another thing that's finally um, relevant, I think, and quite interesting about this is that the, 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 the text, um, Art Market Affluence and uh, Degradation, was very heavily criticized um, within art and language itself. And when we started off today, one of the first things that how mentioned, I, we didn't plan this, it's just a, an irony, um, but uh, he, he mentioned Trotsky. 
And this um, counterblast to Ian Burns' article from the English Art and Language Group takes this quote from Trotsky to the effect that there are some people who only succeed in remaining revolutionists by keeping their eyes shut. And Michael Baldwin's comment, which is sort of blown up on the right there, is that uh, it should be pointed out that when you shut yourself in the dark, opening your eyes makes no difference. And I take it that um, Michael Baldwin's point there, the object of his criticism, was the New York art world, if not the world of art in general. And so the sense that this sense of a community needing to do something is seen as a kind of pipe dream on the part of other members of the self-same community. And I think it's interesting that when Ian Byrne did open his eyes, so to speak, he walked out of that art world. He left the New York art world, stopped being an artist, went back to Australia, and started doing trade union work in, with the Labour government in Australia in the late 70s. And there were many other people in that um, community that did a similar kind of thing. And um, to a certain extent, I was one myself, and there were other people in New York art language who did similar kinds of work. And although Ian Byrne himself is dead now, uh, most of those people have come back, as it were, either to uh, the world of academe or to the world of art practice. There's a sense of being sort of caught and brought back. Um, I'm not sure who it was or what it was that enforced the return, and I'm not sure what the consequences of, of it are. But I do think that um, in the light of the, the text here, the thing about the influence of the, the market and the, um, the power of you know, all the kinds of um, careering and so forth that goes on now, that we, we found ourselves in the last few minutes in the, the, the discussion that we were having before we broke, which seems to me the discussion that we should take up again now, is that uh, we, we end with um, something ironically quite close to uh, Marx's old um, problem in the final thesis on Feuerbach about um, describing the world or changing it, and or changing it. So I'll leave you with that.